on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program American labor lawyer uh, based in Chicago, author of over a dozen, a half dozen books, uh, including his latest, Only One Thing Can Save Us. Uh, welcome to the program, Thomas Gagan. Hi, Sam. Thanks for inviting me. So uh, I, I I really enjoyed your book, and we, you know we we just uh, coincidentally had uh, Stanley Aronowitz on the program last week, also talking about um, uh, the the labor movement, and um, so I, I want to uh, just it's interesting where where some of your solutions I think in, in some way uh, dovetail, um, but I want to start with what the uh, the the question is what. What are we? Do we need saving from at this point? Uh, I, I would say that we need saving from uh, the corruption of our character more than anything else. Now, you could put it in all sorts of different ways. Some people pr- prefer to say we're going to lose the middle class. We're going to have an increase in inequality. All of that is true. We may have wages go up a little bit in the coming year, but that's like a kind of reversion to a mean, and the mean is dropping, dropping, dropping. During this period of dropping, 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 which could go on with the dollars and knobs up the way they are for decades, there'll be years where things go up, blip, uh, and then they go back down. The long-term, what economists call the secular long-term trend, is that wages are flat, falling, while productivity increases. And... Um, let me. A uh, uh, statistic is uh, just uh, you could pick one of a gazillion statistics, but from 2000 to 2012, the pay of the bottom 70% of Americans, of, I can use that term, bottom 70% of Americans, was flatter falling, even as productivity rose 7%. And if you look at a longer term, 79 to the present. Um, uh, the pay went up maybe um, average pay a lot of people dropped but average pay probably went up from 79 to the present about 5% but productivity rose 75% in, in other words all this extra growth is going to the top but here's what we need to be saved from we need to be saved from this loss of our sense of citizenship this loss of a sense of control over our lives and that's why we need to have more control over what we do at work. Uh, because if we have this kind of, uh, if we take the bad habits that we're learning in a union-free world, in the workplace where we spend most of our working lo- waking lives, learned helplessness, being disengaged, following orders, into a democratic society and uh, expect that society to work, we're deluding ourselves. That's what we need saving from. And um, I mean, there's there's a lot to unpack in, in in all of that. And I guess it's all in some ways. I guess the the um, the loss of real wages is a manifestation, or a I guess a a, a byproduct of of that um, uh, of that dilemma where we have sort of lost our uh, power as workers in the context of work and in our, our ability to have some measure of not necessarily self-determination, but of sort of broadly speaking, just broad, broad determination, I guess, as to where we are going. And um, well, just- let me put it in more graphic terms for um, uh, young people who uh, have really gotten slashed. I mean, these, these numbers look better than they should because we're talking about a baby boom generation that is higher skilled than the um, cohorts that are coming up behind us, par- partly because um, we're, we're de-skilling work. That's one of the things that I'm arguing for in this, uh, arguing about, uh, making the case for in this book. Let's talk about young people. Um, their wages really are dropping. I mean, this isn't a case of stagnation compared to uh, earnings of 20 to 30s, maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. And they are in lower skilled jobs and they are trapped in those got jobs. And we have college graduates uh, coming out uh, with uh, some with very high skills, degrees in biology and chemistry, who are working as temps for big companies like Abbott Labs and other places. Um, <clears throat> 
that um, we don't, it's not, Sam, that we don't have unions anymore. We don't even have employers. I mean, so imagine a world in which people are so isolated um, with nobody mentoring them, with no employment relationship that's real from day to day. They're, we're all heading into a kind of temp category, uh, or at least younger people are, um, with nobody to watch their backs, nobody to watch out for them. I mean, it's it's a formula for a really unpleasant um, uh, future. I mean, it's it's interesting. I don't want to say dystopian, but well, it's, I it's mean, very bleak. Yeah, yeah compared, I mean, I, compared to what people used to have, and 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 when you see these polls that people don't trust institutions, especially young people don't trust institutions, there aren't any institutions out there that watch their backs, that protect them, that look out for them. Uh, there isn't the the uh, union guy or 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 the or even a supervisor at work because you don't have employers anymore who will say don't do that kid watch out for that uh, don't take this dope and expect to pass the drug test you know that that kind of thing is just disappearing uh, as people are um, just put out there on their own that's what's really dangerous. I, I, so I, I just want to be clear on on that that dynamic where you have uh, basically I don't know what it's what what the technical term for this is insourcing outsourcing on it's outsourcing I guess a a labor force but uh, not necessarily internationally outsourcing it just uh, instead of you dealing with having to uh, hire and have human resources uh, in your company. You just hire another company to do all the hiring. And so there's nobody in the company. What you're saying is that, uh, hey, I had your job 25 years ago, and this is the way that I worked my way through this company, et cetera, et cetera. It is just a, a bunch of disparate people just sort of floating through. It's almost sort of the the next step when you, when you have a conveyor belt um, going from uh, artisans to, I guess, uh, conveyor belts and factories. This is the next step of uh, yeah, of you alienation. Said very well. I mean, there, there aren't there aren't uh, uh, there aren't classifications anymore. Um, you don't uh, work at developing a skill, so you're pushed up to a higher classification. You're a temp forever. We're all at entry level forever. And and uh, this, uh, the, I'm, I'm trying in this book to contrast the reality. And this is is. You know, Sam, because you've read the book, this is just kind of a small part of it, really. But it, uh, in, in one part of the book, I'm trying to contrast this reality uh, where we aren't uh, doing more to invest in um, younger, middle-aged workers, invest, uh, uh, skill them up um, uh, against this kind of bogus rhetoric that, yes, we're looking for higher qualifications all the time, and this is a world in which we need more and more job training and this and that and the other thing. Uh, that's the official chamber of commerce, Kiwanis Club, Democratic Party, Republican Party, uh, not so much Republican Party, refreshingly, um, the Democratic Party blather. But the, the reality uh, is that um, there's no interest in doing that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, the interest is in making people as powerless as possible, uh, certainly to have a kind of, you know, managerial group that watches over them and sort of passes them along but the but the managers don't know that much about the work production process either they came out of you know x y and z business school and you know never as my mother used to say about some other women she knows she never soiled a dish you know? <laughs> um and they never um did any work on the production line so um let's stop and and of course the United States is is uh, is notorious for um, uh, getting rid of manufacturing. You know how, how often do I hear people uh, tell me, oh well, this is uh, you know it's we're moving into an employee free world and it's manufacturing. You don't understand. Hey, you know, uh, does anybody in this country have a clue as to what's going on in other countries? It's not. In we have nine percent of our workforce in manufacturing. Germany, which is paying higher wages than we do, higher wages than we do, um, has 25% of their workforce in manufacturing. We have about 12% of our GDP coming out of manufacturing. Germany has 25%. What's the reason for that? 
reason for that, I go into it in this book in some detail, is you can just make a lot more money with financial instruments in this country than you can in um, you know, making durable goods. And, 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 and as you know, I spent a, a whole chapter talking about Keynes's concern. Yes. Um, in the general theory, this is John Maynard Keynes, uh, arguing in, uh, in the 1930s, you can't run a trade deficit. You know, we're, we're, we're high-fiving ourselves because we brought our trade deficit down a little bit, thanks to um, oil. But our merchandise trade deficit has been going up, and we are still running the world's biggest whopping trade deficit, uh, even as we congratulate ourselves on how it's been dropping. Uh, it hasn't dropped nearly enough. And the reason for that, or, or Keynes would say, what's the reason for that? Keynes would say, well, you're allowing too much of your investment to go in the financial sector and not into the uh, into durable goods. And he was that saying this, quaint, but he, it's exactly the truth. And Justice, he was saying this 80 years ago, or some odd, uh, when as opposed to. Uh, now, when the percentage of our economy is far more dominated by uh, finance yeah. than it was at that time. And, and a lot of our Keynesian economists here don't uh, pick up on that. And one of the points of the book is, if you're a Keynesian or want to be a Keynesian, why don't you read the whole book, General Theory? Because there's a part two in it where he talks about it's, it's not only important to keep up aggregate demand, which, by the way, is harder and harder to do, because wages are too low. And one of the things that Keynes says in the, to the book that's really salient and, and applicable now is that it's hard to keep up aggregate demand if you've got wages set too low. That's why the government comes in and has to pump things up. But the fundamental problem is that the government comes in and pumps things up with the notion that somehow or another that's going to raise aggregate demand again and solve this problem that led Keynes to write the book. But if, if aggregate demand uh, if wages don't go up, you're just locked into this kind of stagnation forever. And I think if he were alive today, he'd be pointing that out to us. But the other part of Keynes that people don't focus on is um, his, his waving his arms uh, throughout this book, and especially towards the end, and saying, you can't run a trade deficit. Um, and that's exactly what we're doing, kind of uniquely among high-wage countries. There are a lot of other high-wage countries that aren't running trade deficits the way we are. We're unique, and it's not because of NAFTA, and it's not because of the Pacific Trade Agreement or anything else. It's because we have all the dials and knobs set in this country to invest in finance and to invest in low-wage jobs because we let we let wages be really low. Let's, I mean, let's talk about this finance thing for a bit more because, you know, and, and uh, you know, ultimately um, the, the uh, only thing that can save us um, is this uh, a return to a sort of a, I guess, a, a new kind of uh, labor movement as you uh, just basically yeah. restate the title. But, but one of the things that strikes me too, and, and, and I'm getting ahead of myself just a little bit, but with this, but was that, not only do we have a problem where finance, where we have so much money tied up in finance in this country as opposed to manufacturing, but we also have a problem, and, 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 and this, you know, like I said, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I want to I wanna uh, address this. Uh, we also have a problem where it seems to me where a lot of our, uh, our corporate governance has turned uh, these uh, corporations – into financial instruments in and of themselves for people like the CEO and the, the board of directors. Uh, Bill Lazonic out of UMass has done a lot of work on this, where the change in compensation in the, uh, the uh, 70s and 80s, or particularly the early 80s, to where you had CEOs and board of directors getting uh, stock options, and they did this because they were getting favorable uh, tax treatment uh, with Reagan, Basically turned the 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 uh, the the CEOs basically had a cottage industry, which was basically a side bet on their own company. And so uh, investing in their own companies, uh, dealing with a labor force, all those things became secondary to raising the the value of their stocks, which was essentially where their compensation came from anyway. So it wasn't the actual performance of the company, the long-term prospects of the company, but rather how it did in terms of their stock portfolio. And that has fundamentally shifted the, the, the governance of these corporations. And, yeah, and well, there's, uh, the stockholders, the, the, these CEOs are no longer accountable to stockholders. And, and there's something anachronistic about the Dodd-Frank uh, approach, which is to try to 
um, put back in place uh, something that's been broken irrevocably, which is the old stockholder model. Um, and and I, I don't think Dodd-Frank does a very good job of doing that. It's just little baby steps. But uh, as, as we move to these mutual funds, and there's some stuff in the news now that, play, uh, that some of the mutual funds like Vanguard are going to try to be more conscientious about uh, good government uh, of the companies they invest in. But you know, I'm, I'm skeptical that anything will come of it. That's been said over, off and on at different times by different funds over the years. Um, the, the problem is that there's, um, th- th- there's no accountability uh, for the for-profit companies, just as, by the way, there's no accountability at all for these huge not-for-profits, the medical centers, the universities, that are supposed to have these charitable missions that nobody really enforces anymore, and, and the boards are self-perpetuating. So um, uh, you, you start to see not only these huge paydays in the for-profit sector, because there's nobody to stop it, no stockholder control, but uh, huge paydays in uh, the not-for-profit sector. It, it, it's, it's, uh, but let me make, I, I'm not going to defend the way, and, and you stated it very well, that, uh, that, corp, that corporations themselves become financial instruments because uh, you use uh, corporate cash to uh, bid up the stock price, which uh, bids up the CEO salaries, et cetera, et cetera. It's all pernicious, I agree. But um, let me say something in their defense. They are sitting on piles of cash, and they aren't investing. Um, but it's um, hard to make a case for them to invest as much as they should when aggregate demand is so low. And aggregate demand is so low is because we have a dysfunctional labor model. We aren't paying people enough. So how does the labor movement help in this? Number one, you know, push up aggregate demand. Number two, a new kind of labor movement, not resuscitating the old organized labor, which is banging on the outside for higher wages, but a new kind of labor movement, more like the European labor movements, where you uh, is what we need here to put in place a stock a stakeholder, not stockholder, stakeholder model. Um, and by that, I mean specifically... Uh, a system where you have employees electing some, not all, not the majority, not necessarily half and half like in Germany, but maybe more like in Belgium and other countries where you're electing maybe a third of the directors of the uh, board so that there's somebody in the room that can look the other directors in the eye and say, hey, we're here and um, uh, push corporations to have some accountability at least to the people who are giving career link service to them. Though, so, of course, if the corporation is hiring only temps, you could say nobody's giving career link service to it anymore. But that that that's the ideal. I mean, when I mean, and that sounds great to me. But um, from the perspective of the CEO and the board of directors who are saying, like, okay, and I, I take your point that there isn't anything for them to necessarily invest in if they don't anticipate any any demand. But it doesn't seem to me that that's that is the primary force. What seems to me the primary force is that these board of directors and the CEO knows. Look, if I do a stock buyback. Uh, this is going to push up my compensation directly. I mean, it is, there is a, uh, it, it's irrelevant, you know, uh, demand is, is all good and uh, profits are all good, but there's another way to get profit, higher profit margin, that's to me to cut my labor force. Yeah, and I, when I, I do understand, that, and I, I agree with that, but, you, you know, the world's complicated and there, uh, there right. are lots of different aspects and variables to this, and, but, and, and, and not everybody in the corporate world is a thief. Um, you know, so well, it, it's, it, I, I, I would just say that, that's one problem that has to be addressed, but it has to be addressed with these other problems as well. I mean, what we're trying to do, um, uh, I mean, there's always peer pressure to some extent. You know, if, if, if you can, um, uh, uh, how should I say it? If, if you bring back a labor movement that is capable of at least sustaining aggregate demand in an adequate way, and you bring back a labor movement which, where people have more control over what they say and do at work. And if you bring back a labor movement that is able to provide some way of mobilizing people back into the political process, which is what labor is so, used to be so great at doing, and, and now we have voter turnout rates of 37% in midterms and so forth, it, it, and and put back in place things like um, interest rate caps and uh, um, um, 
things like that. And if you have a labor movement, and I talk about ways in which you might start moving towards co-determination even now at the state level, through state level actions, um, that could get some bigger voice within the corporations, we, we, we have to press on all those things simultaneously, um, even though they're all very complicated to do. Uh, we have to do them all at once. Uh, it, it's... Um, and that's the agenda that I'm trying to lay out in this book and trying to explain how we can do them all at once, that it's not hopeless um, and that there are really uh, possible ways out of this um, gridlocked, uh, uh, dysfunctional uh, shareholder model, uh, a dysfunctional uh, labor representation model. Um, and I, as you know, I go into that in quite some detail as to why our system of exclusive representation, which is the hallmark of the American style labor movement, doesn't work anymore. Yes, I actually I want to get and, in. Um, and our dysfunctional uh, gridlocked political model. We have we have to fix them all at once. But bringing back the labor movement is key to working on all three of those. Um, I want to get I, I want to get into that because that's I, I, I think that's um, that is interesting and it's something that I've been hearing quite a bit about the idea of uh, I, I've heard different people say it in different ways uh, minority representation I mean basically sort of what we're seeing at this um, uh, at this Volkswagen plant in Tennessee that failed to uh, to organize I guess it was about a year ago but before we get to there I just want to get to just I also want to touch on because. Um, uh, get back to the education uh, thing because one thing that strikes me in your criticism of of the uh, uh, of uh, Democratic Party and just sort of I guess the liberal left in espousing education as a panacea for um, what ails us in 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 that labor sector is this. Uh, a lot of educators basically say to me that, you know, we've got it backwards. The things that are inhibiting education output are the things that we are uh, prescribing education to fix. Uh, can you can you just talk about um, uh, just the, the fallacy of of uh, of why we need a sort of a more educated labor force? You touched you touched on it briefly, but uh, could you just go into that a little bit more? Well, um, I feel odd saying this, uh, uh, Sam, because uh, on the one hand, people uh, have picked up this book and said, uh, oh, so um, you're talking about the fallacy of, uh, of, of education. Um, you know, as I said in the book, I think we need more education, but I've, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a different kind of education than we're pushing. So, uh, I mean, the obvious, um, uh, maybe too obvious uh, uh, point, which is starting to come out now, is that um, uh, we have expanded college education dramatically, and it's done nothing to bring down inequality in the country. Uh, and we do have... Um, uh, uh, even a growing number of college grads, not just in debt, but stuck in non-college jobs, it's something like 20%. And the college jobs aren't paying more. Of course, there are exceptions. But if you if you pare down those exceptions, you're looking at people who have uh, elite educations, postgraduate educations, not college BAs. Um, and the notion that more and more education is going to save us in a system that is pushing people more and more into entry level. I mean, the people who are temps are college grads, right? Um, it, it's just a profound disconnect. And, and the party, and by the party, I mean the Democratic Party, the leadership in D.C., is faintly understanding, beginning to understand that this isn't quite right, their message, but they still haven't gotten it. And they, and um, uh, Obama's famous Potawatomi speech is um, uh, where he talked about inequality. You know, it is, it's eloquent. You know, it quotes Theodore Roosevelt and uh, the people back at the progressives at the turn of the century and this and that and the other thing, and it says all the right things. And then at the end, he gets to the solution. Well, what's the solution? It's uh, put more people in a college. First of all, it's so it's so insulting to <laughs> or demoralizing to the base of the Democratic Party. Most people in this country are high school graduates. Uh, you know, it's only like 30% of adult Americans, 24 to 65, who have college degrees. That means 70% don't. That means that the Democratic Party is telling <clears throat> lower income, lower skilled people, there's no hope for you. Right. And you can imagine how white males react to that, just with fury. Black males, African-American males, um, 
uh, uh, Latino uh, males, not so much with so much fury. They've got no place to go except the Democratic Party because uh, the answer of the white males is to go after the minority uh, 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 race males. But um, it, it's 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 it kind of writes off everybody. It, 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 it's like, hey, it's too late for you. Um, you know, maybe we can do something for your kids, which they no longer believe at some level. So um, it, it, there are two. It also, it also deflects. Reactions. Either they believe this, um, that it's too late for them, in which case they're mad at the Democratic Party, or they don't believe it, that it's too late for them, in which case they're mad at the Democratic Party. You know, I mean, it's just the worst possible message to be to offer as the solution to raising your standard of living in this country. And it's also a poor policy prescription. It's a way of sort of deflecting from what is sort of systemically uh, problematic. It's not, uh, you know, like you say, it's not a lack of education. All right, so let's talk about wh- how, wh- what does a new labor movement look uh, look like? And, and, and also talk about what um, I know that you feel that uh, most people don't realize about the, the power that uh, they have still under the National uh, Labor Relations Act, um, you know, there's uh, in, in terms of uh, of striking. Well, a new labor movement would be one uh, which is uh, uh, number one. Uh, it focuses much more on democracy of the workplace. Um, uh, number two, it it um, unleashes people to control their own labor movement. Um, and and um, uh, uh, number three, uh, gives up this principle of exclusive representation in order to make the labor movement more militant than it is. And let me go back and talk about um, uh, more democracy in the workplace. I, I, it, it's, um, the, the great need is to pick up habits of citizenship where we spend our waking lives in the workplace. And, and I, I'm really big on pushing sort of what, what the Germans and the Europe, other Northern Europeans are doing, works councils that everybody in the plan elects that have real uh, statutory rights, control over uh, in setting uh, the schedules, how the place works, and getting information uh, from uh, corporate records and so forth, and being really part of the governing structure of the company. Um, in that respect, I talk about various ways of pushing... Um, um, uh, both co-determination and works councils. Um, the, I, I also want to emphasize how important it is to move to a Civil Rights Act model of enforcing labor rights instead of this old NLRB model that is amending the Civil Rights Act or having a separate Civil Rights Act for labor so that people could go out, get their own lawyers, bring their own cases in court, not depend on union lawyers like me who are being paid a certain amount, have those lawyers go and when people are fired or harassed on the job for their support of a union in a way that's unlawful, go in for the kind of remedies that you can get under the Civil Rights Act, preliminary injunctions, punitive damages, but most of all, discovery Discovery, discovery, discovery is what changes behavior of corporations, you know, rifling through their files, poking through their house, so to speak, deposing their CEOs. None of that can happen now under the existing model. And if you expand the civil rights model to protect people's right to be union members, that would have a huge impact on corporate behavior, just as the civil rights laws have had a huge impact on corporate behavior. Is that, is that a model, or is that uh, a, a system that is sort of statutory? Uh, it's well, it's it's a model uh, and statutory, of course. I mean, it's a it's a it's a paradigm. It's a it's. I mean, do we need, in other law. words, do we need to, I mean, do we need to rely on uh, changes in the the National uh, Labor Relations Act to, to you get... You need a law. Yeah, so, the law. Yeah, that, that brings up the need to get rid of the filibuster in the Senate, gerrymandering of the U.S. House. And you may say, well, that's not going to happen now. No, it's not going to happen right now. But you also, it's time for people on the left to start playing the long game. I mean, in the end, what we want over the next 10 years is the Civil Rights Act for Labor. But in the meantime, uh, and here, as you point out, Sam, I am using, I spent a lot of time talking about uh, 
the UAW engagement with Volkswagen in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, dear to my heart because I wrote a book about Germany and German works councils, and here the whole thing has come to America, and there's a kind of a rich irony in the fact that while globalization may have hurt the United States in particular because it has it is such a low wage country uh, and it doesn't you know pump up wages to, and skills to compete globally the way we should that in a perverse way globalization may end up saving us because we do have uh, rich countries whether it's Germany Japan um, Sweden even um, coming here and and uh, setting up shop in places like the South. And we finally had a union, the United Auto Workers go in, work with the workers back in the home country and confront these employers and say, why don't you act towards us here the way you do back in the home country and not just in the home country. You know, Volkswagen has something like 27 plants, indebted plants in 27 different countries around the world, 27 different countries. In, in 25 of those countries, Volkswagen has a system that's like the German system in various ways, to various degrees. There's a works council, workers are represented, blah, 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 blah. 25 of the 27. Guess which two they don't. One is China, the other is the United States. Right. And one day they'll have it in China. You know, it, it's... So, well, so Tom, at, at explain last, this. somebody woke up here and said, hey, why don't we have the same thing here? Well, explain to me how, the, because there's two things that are happening there. There's one, we're seeing that type of work with the management. The two, we're also seeing, uh, and this is particularly, uh, well, I mean, it's less relevant because we're talking about a private union, but um, this notion of minority representation or lack of uh, exclusive uh, representation, in other words, uh, only about 45 percent of the workers in, uh, in, in, in Tennessee uh, uh, working for Volkswagen are represented by the union. Um, did, but Volkswagen is talking to them. Right, exactly. And now, now was this because... My sense from afar has been that Volkswagen wanted to get into this relationship because they found it to be uh, profitable and functional and, and advantageous in their other uh, companies. Or was it that the workers no, got the got the the international unions to put pressure on Volkswagen? Uh, well, the national unions. Uh, it, it's uh, first of all, uh, talking about Volkswagen is complicated um, because. It does have works councils and it does have co-determination. So you're talking about a company that has unionism built into it to a certain degree. Now, not that the labor people run it; they don't. But they, um, you know, they're, they they have very powerful friends in in high places in Volkswagen. People who came up through the unions, or or um, and and the works councils are part of the corporate structure right. of Volkswagen. So. Um, uh, you know, it's a little hard for Americans to get their minds around it because it it it's not like our kind of business corporation. It's there there. It's pluralistic. I mean, there are you know pro union factions within Volkswagen. Let's put it that way. Well, I guess what I'm Having saying is that it's, how do it's we a real company and and uh, and there are uh, uh, factions that are anti union, and it's not that Volkswagen thinks this is a good deal for America or that it's so nice. It's just got pressures within its own company uh, to uh, have this model um, replicated in other countries. Well, so, so how do we replicate it on. in other companies? I mean, that's, I guess, the question is, like, is this something that is just so unique to Volkswagen that it really doesn't have any lesson uh, for, uh, for the way that unions interact with uh, companies, uh, you know, outside of Volkswagen in that's this country? That's a good country? question. And I, I would say that Volkswagen is certainly one of the uh, German global companies uh, that is... Um, uh, bigger on this, but I, I think um, where Volkswagen goes, other companies are going. I mean, it's not that, it's not that different uh, with Daimler-Benz and BMW. What's been different uh, now is that the UAW has been mobilizing not just uh, the unions in Germany, although that's a big deal, that's a big part of it, but the unions in other countries where these uh, uh, corporate um, uh, giants have uh, have gone, and uh, if you are just focusing on Northern European companies alone, that in itself is quite something. 
you know, if that model gets introduced here into the United States just from those companies, which is what I suggest could happen here, very much could happen here, um, that creates a kind of alternative model that other Americans, because it's now on our shore, can see. It's like, right. um, uh, you know, you... you, you mm, um, you're the Spanish conquistadors, and you bring over uh, microbes and plants and other things, and they start to fertilize and spread in the new world. I mean, it's kind of a weird analogy, but there, there, we are. Uh, it's a new, how shall I say it? Uh, it's a new plant in the right. new world. At at plants and of all places, the non-union Dixie uh, uh, South. If you see a situation, if um, the white males and females who are voting in the South for uh, Republicans start seeing a system where the union doesn't control the works councils. They don't have to be in the union. It's, it's voluntary. On the other hand, they have all these rights to run the, the place. Um, it, 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 it starts to get the message across that labor is not something that's being imposed on people from outside, but it's, it's, uh, there is a, or a huge adversarial um, uh, relationship with companies, um, but, but something that makes sense and empowers them. I hate that word, empowers, but let's use it because I can't think of anything else. Um, and, and it becomes very attractive. If it happens at Volkswagen, if it happens at Nissan, if it happens at uh, BMW, why not other places? You right. know, and, and one of the reasons that... Um, people uh, like uh, uh, the Tennessee governor and um, uh, the senator, Bob Corker, you know, are so fanatic about stopping Volkswagen from doing this is that they don't want anybody else to see it. And, and that's what we should be focusing on right now, putting in place things that people can see in their own backyard as alternatives to the kind of lives that are um, being dictated for them. Um, uh, you know, this is a lot better than spending your life as a temp, being on a works council or serving on a corporate board. We, we, we've gone l uh, long here, but I, I still, uh, if you don't mind, if you have a couple more minutes, I just want to yeah. ask you about the other sort of movement that we're seeing, uh, the other sort of, I guess, new or semi-new paradigm, or maybe it's a return to an old paradigm we're seeing with the fast food workers around the country, people who are not in a, um, a, a formal union who are... Um, who are exercising their ability to walk off uh, in, uh, the, the job for an hour or two or for a couple hours and then come back on. I mean, uh, talk about why that's so powerful. Uh, and, and also your perspective on the raising of the minimum wage. I know that you are obviously uh, in support of it, but you see it as not the sort of panacea that I think some people see it as. No, I, I don't. Which one do you want me to go first on? What now, you... One of the things people have forgotten over the years is, um, and it's hard to keep it in your head, I admit. Um, in the United States, an employer can fire you for any reason, for any time, for the color of your tie, for doing good work. You know, they can bring you in and say, Sam, you are the best who's ever been, but you're fired. Why? I don't know. I just decided to do it. And I've gotten fired multiple no times that whatsoever. way, I should say. But... If you work as a um, you know a nine dollar an hour employee at Starbucks and you walk out in the morning rush hour when the line is out the door and down the block with two other employees and just say we're going to go out for eh, fifteen or twenty minutes uh, because we're really mad that you haven't been scheduling us in the way that uh, would uh, make sense uh, of, of our very uh, uh, difficult lives and given us consistent schedules. Um, and you create this huge disruption and just ruin everything, they can't fire you. You know, <laughs> so it's uh, it's a pretty bizarre um, legal system, but they can't fire you because why? Because Section 7 of the Wagner Act says that you have a right to engage in concerted activity. If you go out on your own with nobody with you, yes, you can be fired. If you go out with one other person, you can't be fired. Uh, and because then you're acting in concert with a fellow employee about working conditions. Both my producers are looking at each other right now in a way that's making me a little bit concerned. But Oh, well, Sam, just get somebody to walk out with you. That's all you have to do. Right. I'm, um, I'm so, uh, uh, but the... Um, I forgot the second part. Of well, the second part was the uh, about the, the minimum wage and why this oh, is... minimum wage. 
Uh, of course I'm in favor of, of, of raising the minimum wage. I can't think of a better cause in the world. On the other hand, uh, you know, it's sort of like two cheers, um, the, um, maybe two and a half cheers, um, maybe 2.9 cheers. But, but it's not completely three cheers because to the extent that you are using local governments as substitutes for a labor m- movement, you are really accommodating people's helplessness. And one of the great things about Fight for 15 is that at least some people are walking out, um, and that is creating pressure on uh, uh, local governments. But it's no substitute for a labor movement that protects people from being jerked around at work. And it's no substitute for the kind of broader corporate democracy that I'm talking about that might exist in in Europe. And I have to say it doesn't exist very uh, uh, much in in the low-wage world. Um, and, and it's especially alarming if this labor movement, uh, for, to, to the extent that there are worker opportunity centers that are spreading, if, if they're just being funded by foundations and not by the labor movement itself, that's very disturbing. Uh, one day the money will run out. So it, it, it's, um, it's great. Um, um, it's maybe not so great to the extent that it, accommodates uh, a system where people don't have any power and have to rely upon government uh, to step in and put up these floors and minimums. And um, But, well, you know, let, it's, uh, given how much, uh, you know, when, when you look at the minimum wage, the what what is shocking is the amount of noncompliance with it, even with the minimum wage laws that exist. Uh, and, and I'm not talking about the South where it's just out of control or red states. I'm talking about blue states like California, New York. There was just a study done. It's something like uh, some figure 10 to 20 percent of the employers just don't bother with it. it, it it's, uh, it's not just that we have to um, – uh, get government to stop wage theft, get government to uh, have minimum wage. We need to be in a world where it doesn't even cross the employer's mind to do that. And that requires putting a labor movement in place. So let me, so broadly speaking, I mean, to wrap this up, that, that dynamic that you're talking about, where obviously it's important that people get a living wage uh, and $15 an hour is barely even there, frankly, uh, you know, relative to productivity and, and inflation, et cetera, et cetera. But that... It has the effect, it seems to me, uh, I mean, from your, your perspective, the, 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 to the extent that there's ambivalence there, it has the effect of not putting labor in a position of having to basically get there on their own, which um, it decreases their, their power in other sectors or other aspects of what they should be doing. And I wonder if that isn't the overall sort of, or one of the overall problems with, uh, or, or accounts for the lack of a genuine labor movement in this country. If it isn't, uh, on some level that the, what organized labor has been seeking has become so narrow in some respects. And part of that is because there isn't the level of deprivation that we saw in the 1920s that, you know, you weren't uh, organizing may have been a little bit more uh, natural when it was a question of like, if I go into work today, there's a decent chance that uh, I could I could die. Uh, well, I, I understand that. So people aren't in the backyard shooting squirrels when they're unemployed because, uh, we now have unemployment insurance, and we have all these things that um, uh, the Keynesian revolution, uh, the rise of the CIO, the New Deal, and uh, just common sense put in place, uh, uh, and, and all sorts of floors. Yes, of course, um, and uh, people aren't starving. And uh, middle class life, we are at a higher level of GDP per capita, and people live a lot better, diet and everything else, than they did in the 1930s. So. Uh, all of that is true. On the other hand, people are more powerless than they were then. And, and there's one phenomenon that didn't exist back then. You know, if, uh, you know, the 1920s and, 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 19, uh, and the Gilded Age is, 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 is one thing. But um, uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, and I, when I went to college in 1967 and took ec- Economics 1, they were still teaching it, 
you know, wages went up with productivity, roughly. Sometimes it went up ahead of productivity, and then you had inflation. But it, there's no connection anymore between what people are giving and what they're getting back. And there's um, uh, that's, in a way, people in that sense are, are being treated as they were in the Gilded Age in the 1920s, um, I quote one professor uh, who said, you know, I used to think that the uh, Gini index, that's the inequality index in the United States, was reaching uh, the Gilded Age. He said, now I think it's back in the Middle Ages. And this is kind of a moderate centrist guy at Harvard University. It, 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 in some ways, we're more deprived now. And, and, and to the extent that you see um, props that were there that have gone, it, 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 it's very disturbing. I, I came out of law school hoping and expecting to be kind of an ERISA lawyer. ERISA is Employee Retirement Income Security Act. It's a pension law. But there are no pension plans anymore because um, the premise of the law was that there would be these private pension plans because unions would bargain for them. But what they didn't figure on was that there wouldn't be any unions anymore. So, uh, and in fact, private, in the Cromnibus, we just saw an ability basically to to renege on a lot of those promises. Yeah, all these income stats about um, you know wages flat or falling are misstated to the extent that they leave out the fact that for millions and millions and millions and millions of workers, they've seen their uh, health. Uh, plans disappear. The deductibles uh, go up to the roof to five thousand dollars a family, uh, uh, and and no pension plan gone. That's a huge drop in your standard of living. And and so yes, we're better off, and yes, we're deprived in ways that uh, you know have been unknown in this country since the nineteen twenties. Thomas Gagan, uh, the book is the only thing that can save us. Why America Needs a New Kind of Labor Movement. We will link to it at majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time today. Sure. Thank you, Sam.